world space, uh, you will immediately think of that it's really a game of trade-offs. In fact, somebody says that engineering is all about trade-offs, right? Uh, so that is also the theme of the panel. Uh, and there are several trade-offs that are encountered in the space. The very first one is, you know, how much data are you going to collect? And what are you doing with how hard will you work on it? Uh, versus what is the benefit you're going to get and the cost you have to pay. And the cost would be in terms of systems, in terms of power. It could be in terms of potential privacy violations and so on. So there's a very broad notion of costs. Uh, and then there's a very broad notion of what you can do. And, the, and then there's a cost to effort trade off there. Uh, you can also think about at the systems level, you know, what are the things you want to do at the edge, uh, somewhere in between at the cloud. And once again, you know, there's a standard trade off in computer systems or computer architecture. What are the things you want to migrate to a very low level or to the hardware versus, say, the software, which in this case would be the cloud? Uh, so that's another fundamental trade-off you could think about. Um, also, very intimately related is what are the things you want to do uh, in real time? And the two of our speakers this morning emphasized real-time aspects. Uh, and then how real should real-time be? You know, real-time is 10 milliseconds or two seconds? And once again, there's a slew of trade-offs there. So the, the central theme of this panel is going to be uh, for I'll be requesting each of the panelists to focus on one or two key trade-offs which, which is close to their heart and what, what and their thoughts and guidance as to how to best resolve those trade-offs uh, at two stages. One is given the current uh, technology and state of the art, and also you know as these problems are being solved, you know the trade-off points are going to move. So you know what do they uh, foresee? Would the key trade-offs be you know three four years? down the road. So for the students out here in the audience, you know, so the good PhD thesis is when you graduate, that's when the topic starts becoming hot, okay? So for you guys, I think the three to four years uh, is, is also going to be very uh, particularly useful. So um, let me just introduce the uh, panelists in um, alphabetical uh, last name order. Uh, so we have uh, Vijay Bhagavat. And uh, Vijay is uh, a VP at, uh, uh, at uh, Deutsche Bank, and he's the analyst for this space, which is wireless and communications. He's actually one of the co-authors of the report that Brian made, Modoff showed in the beginning of this uh, uh, um, summit. And uh, he has a, a variety of interests and capabilities. He's taught, like us, at uh, Steve, Steven Tech, NGIT. Uh, he's an inventor. He has 22 patents. And of course, he's an equity analyst as well. So I think that gives a very you know, broad perspective uh, to the panel. Um, and then we have Tom Bradichic, uh, who's uh, with National Instruments. He's come there after an extremely distinguished career at IBM. Uh, so he is the systems person at IBM. You know, any IBM award you can think of, IBM fellow, IBM distinguished engineer, and so on. He's, he's got that. Uh, and he's interested in end-to-end -end building end-to-end -end systems. Um, and he might be talking about the big bad data. So bad is big analog data. And actually, once I saw that acronym, I thought maybe we should, the panel should be, is big data bad? <laughs> uh, and then you can take... Take it any way you want. But he'll definitely be talking about the uh, analog uh, aspects of the uh, side of big data. Uh, then we have Rodolfo Milito, uh, who, like our first panelist, also has a very varied, versatile career. He had a long, distinguished uh, um, uh, innings uh, at Bell Labs. And after that, he became uh, an entrepreneur. He co-founded uh, a company called Concentry. Uh, and now he's uh, in, with Cisco Systems. Uh, and from talking to him, what I gathered is their uh, group is like a um, future prediction type of group. But they also, rather than just speculate, they also actually do things. So you also build things or find partners to build things with, as well as speculate about the future. So that's a very unusual uh, combination to have. Uh, and the finals. Panelist is uh, Dr. Mudhakar Shivasta. So Mudhakar graduated from, did his PhD from Georgia Tech, and he's with IBM TJ Watson. Um, and, and he uh, does research in uh, network systems. So this is a viewpoint from a very research perspective. Uh, and he's also in, involved in several international alliances. There's this 
Alliance for Secure Hybrid uh, Networking and so on. So he, he can also have uh, bring in perhaps a European uh, perspective uh, to the panel. Okay, uh, so I would request each of the panelists, since you are already sorted in alphabetical order, uh, uh, so to go from, uh, well, my right to left, uh, and perhaps spend six to eight minutes, um, you know, with your thoughts on this, uh, and then we'll have a free-for-all uh, discussion uh, till we get hungry enough. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, Joydeep, and uh, great to be here. This is my first time in Austin. I went to, um, I got my PhD from uh, UTA, University of Texas, almost. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's in good humor. So, uh, so uh, you know, I'd like to share with you uh, the networking opportunities in big data. I mean, with all due respect to the big data community, this is my personal view uh, that uh, the big data thinkers and the big data practitioners come from the compute side. I don't know why, maybe that's what it is. So we talk about Hadoop, Big Hive. These seem compute terms. They call services hosts, you know. So I'd like to kind of share with you uh, a fundamental new idea, which, you know, Brian Modoff uh, and I are working on to look at the networking opportunities in big data. And let me drill down some key opportunities. These are very interesting research problems, you know, if you're in graduate school, uh, if any of you are entrepreneurs here, very good startup opportunities for professors, you know, attractive opportunities for getting research grants, doing uh, reports on this, projects on this. So let me start out with a thought. And the thought is, we are seeing a fundamental disruption in the world of networking. What I mean by this is, we are going from, uh, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of servers to hundreds of thousands of servers. And uh, the motivation behind this is cloud applications such as Google Maps, which in my view needs 450,000 servers to run. There are 40 million virtual machines on the planet. And if you talk to AWS, Amazon, my argument is they would say they have two, two and a half million virtual machines running at any instant of time. CRM, Salesforce.com, all of the big data analytics, a Walmart or a Procter & Gamble would run, or a Costco, and you always have your favorite NSA. So my, my view is uh, you, you, the networking problems are important, and the networking problems are underappreciated and understudied. I don't know why, and I think it's because it's the habit of the computer science practitioner to look at a problem one level up. This has been the mindset in computing that Somehow, if you take a problem, push it one level above, it becomes easier and tractable. And then I API into everything else. Well, nice try, because you're ignoring the wealth of information that moves around in networks. So I think the fundamental, and I'll go this line by line, the first opportunity in networking is to build out scale out networks. What I mean by this is when we go from tens of thousands of servers to hundreds of thousands of servers, it's very difficult to build networks the manual way. I mean, I know how networks are built. You have a CCIE with CLI, and it takes you know weeks or months to prep this network. And if you're a service provider, it takes years to prep these networks. But then you have you know impatient companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook, who can't wait for a year to build out their networks. So you have to do things in an automated manner. So what's happening in the world of networking is virtual networks are starting to get built out. I mean, Cisco is you know launching in CME next month, which would have. Uh, overlay networks, VMware came out with NSX overlays. So the interesting problems in networking are how do you look at automatically building networks? It's an important problem, and automation is a difficult problem. In my view, it's uh, ideally you know, uh, an NP hard problem, but to, to make it tractable, my view is there is enough analytics that can be uh, exported and extracted and mined through APIs from network switches, network routers, security appliances, so on and so forth, that can be intelligently leveraged to automatically build networking fabrics at the physical level, networking fabrics at the virtual level, you know, build multiple tenants in clouds. So that's one area of opportunity. I, I call it scale-out networks, for lack of a better word. The second problem is to do with performance optimization on the fly. What I mean by this is all of the big web portals, if you notice, I mean, I personally see when I go to Gmail, oops, we are down. Why should it be oops? You know, why cannot you get make it work? 
So, or you go to, you know, United Airlines, uh, this page cannot be displayed, but I have to take a plane in the next five minutes. It has to be displayed. So where I'm coming from is big data <coughs> analytics are important and instrumental in tweaking networks, tweaking, uh, tweaking application performance on the fly, reprioritizing applications on the fly. I mean, when I was doing my PhD, there were quintillion theses done on quality of service. I would argue 90% of them had zero value. But I think now the value proposition of doing quality of experience, quality of service, application performance optimization on the fly is important. And then switching gears to the third important opportunity, I think it's service chaining. So to be consistent with the mobile and wireless theme here, what I mean by this is, let me give you an example. Defining a service for the teenage demographic is close to impossible because it's very difficult to second guess their preferences. What do they like to opt in, opt on? What do they like to download, upload? What are they willing to pay for, perhaps zero? So my view is where service chaining comes uh, handily with uh, analytics is if you continuously try to analyze their preferences and usage patterns, you can actually define a viable service that has you know, third parties, advertisers, web portals, cloud portals, uh, reverse paying for <coughs> you know, what they do. And you can tweak these services as you go. I mean, Google has this concept of continuous beta. So you can have a continuous beta for defining a service. And then if you run this thing in time, you can actually get a, a practical service, which would ideally uh, you know, appeal to the teen demographic. And then it would evolve over time because every demographic has changing preferences. So just to make it short, scale out networking, especially for web and cloud scale op applications, big problem, important problem, startup opportunities, research opportunities, application performance optimization, leveraging big data analytics, important problem, service chaining, creating services on the fly, important problem. Thanks. Thank You know, uh, my, my colleague Vijay mentioned uh, the importance of websites when they go down when you're attempting to uh, address them. I noticed Instagram is down. Uh, therefore, let me just describe to you what I had for lunch. <laughs> so most of us are not under 25 and don't know what I uh, just alluded to. <laughs> you just got it. Yeah. I did. <laughs> hey, um, as I speak with you, I am going to uh, do it in a um, analog measured time frame of about 480 seconds. And uh, as I speak with you, um, uh, several trillion uh, shifts of radiation will take place with the cesium atom, an analog event. And I will transmit to you analog information using uh, images and light and sound, and your eardrum will vibrate, another analog event. And you'll keep comfortable with the wind flow or the air flow of the uh, AC units and the slight vibrations in the vents, uh, analog events. You know, happening. You'll see me with the light. You'll see my motion, analog event. Uh, the comfort you'll enjoy will be driven by voltage, current, analog events. So you see where I'm going here with, uh, you know, with this notion. Then you'll become bored with what I say, and you will apply pressure, an analog event, to your cell phone and begin to process <laughs> texts and emails. And you will launch them somewhere, right, with one or three or more radios, Bluetooth, you know, wireless or cellular. Again, you know, analog events. And um, speaking of that, real quick, at IBM, I was able to um, uh, observe a phenomenon called the, uh, the PTE, the process text and emails. That unit of measurement, by the way, is inversely proportional to the interest of the speaker. And the inverse proportion holds with respect to the authority of the speaker. So in business, when the boss came in, it would, uh, it would go down significantly regardless of whether he was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I was in a meeting at one time, 13 people were doing their email while the speaker was, uh, was speaking. Anyway, as I move on here in this uh, 480 seconds, um, this is all a particular type of data that's different from what my colleagues are talking about today and maybe likely will for the rest of the day. It is a um, data we call big analog data, and it is everywhere. Uh, it is older than all the other big data we talk about. I would assert that because regardless of your position, if you believe in the Big Bang, that was an analog event, as so, so Joy Deep uh, called it today. Or, or contrary-wise, um, and I quote, God said, let there be light at the beginning of the universe. That is an analog event, you know, as well. It is faster than all the other big data, and I think that's easy when you consider image and light and the spin of electrons that are happening in every atom in your body. Analog events, right? I'm sorry. 
Yes, as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for taking up some of my 480 seconds. <laughs> I was quiet during your. <laughs> but at least he's agreeing with me, and I didn't agree with everything you said, so I, I just want you to know I restrained uh, myself. Because, by the way, I would add a V called uh, visibility to the five Vs because of the distributedness of what you said, you know, as well. That's, that's for free. You can use that. <laughs> it is bigger if you consider, again, the quantum effects, the angular momentum of the electrons in your body, in this room, in this city, in this planet, in the universe. It is bigger, I am asserting, it is bigger than all the other big data combined. That's what I'm saying. That's the world I live in, big analog data. This is a very special type of data. And let me give you some specifics. And I want you to think about the cumulative effect of these, this data as we, uh, you know, as we go on. If we look at a month's time, um, we have customers, this is real world, taking place like a lot of what we're talking about today, that collect five terabytes a month, it, measuring smart grids or measuring turbines, for example, that generate power. Now, that accumulates up five terabytes. You might say, you know, that's not big data, but uh, it accumulates. We have customers um, measuring a um, uh, in-test measurement in South Carolina collecting 10 terabytes a day. They have a really big data problem. We have customers measuring jet engines when they are in flight or in test. Again, 20, as you can see, per hour. Probably the most exciting one is colleagues at CERN, which is, uh, if you might have noticed, is the graphic there, right, with the cyclotrons spinning around. And unlike the Ghostbusters advice, the streams will cross, and then they will discover things such as what? Oh, there's the Higgs boson, right? Um, an analog event for, you know, discovery. They generate 40 terabytes a second. And this accumulates over and over years. I have one customer who said, we are stopped collecting analog data in our experiments. We are going to take the next 15 years and do analytics. <laughs> All right. that's, their, that's their plan. So it's, it's pretty profound. So let me move on um, uh, quickly here. A generalized three-tier big analog data solution. It will now address wireless and analytics, which is the topic of our panel here. Uh, can be looked at like this. It is all about, as you said, the data. And we have portioned the data into five phases, which are on the bottom there, from the sensors in Tier 1, moving to Tier 2, which are DANs, uh, an acronym for Data Acquisition Analysis Systems and Nodes that are networked, and they scale out, and then they go to traditional IT. Real time, as you can see, in motion, early life. There's value in all those levels doing analytics. If you'd like to know if your asset is being monitored, it's going to catch on fire, you want real-time analytics taking place. You don't have time to even move to a server to get this information, some of this. And if you're adjusting the stream of electrons, right, in an experiment, you don't have time for it to get that way. <clears throat> Contrary-wise, you might want, on the other side, uh, of the, pull out archived data that's seven years old and compare it to in-motion data and see what's happening during a, uh, a particular event where a crowd is moving or something, again, an analog effect, or not even an analog effect as well. But this solution, you know, this approach is interesting in that um, my colleagues will talk about T0 of data starting in real time right there. That's common for big data. It's when it hits a switch, usually comes off of a, uh, of a NIC somewhere, it gets into a switch, then it goes into a hard drive, right, and then from that analytic start, that's called in motion or real. In my world, that's really old. That's super, super old <laughs> data because right here is where T0 starts, the point of capture of this analog a phenomenon. And again, think about one of these. Um, there's at least, um, I don't know, eight or nine analog phenomenon that has to be tested before it leaves the line. Uh, do you think the manufacturer wants that thing out fast? Yes. Why? Because if you were ever to look at the night before an announcement of an Apple product in front of an Apple store, what do you see? You have hordes of people, including my son, waiting all night, right, to be the early adopter. And therefore, can you test this in, you know, five minutes? Now can you test it in two? Now can you test it in 20 seconds? You know, getting that speed out is a very commercial value. And um, the wireless dimension of this is, in my world, is really, really, really slow in my world. And this is the trade-offs, you know, that we're making. So analytics, and I, and I portion them into three categories. Uh, there's both engineering and scientific, which are obvious from this analog phenomena. But there's tremendous business insight to be derived. So the time to insight and then the time from insight to decision in a business, in a commercial operation, is the key here. It's all about the data and being able to insightfully pull from it. So wireless here and wireless here. There are two areas of wireless as we get to our topic that we'll talk about. And uh, I realize the profundity of what I'm saying lies not in the fact that I pointed out there are two bottlenecks in the solution. That's pretty straightforward. But rather in the 
things we're doing to solve them, right? And that will be the way I would set up our panel discussion, you know, as well. Increase CPU and memory capability there for data decimation analytics, and then of course smart sensors that move the analysis back here. So you have to, you know, shift, you know, less and less. So with that, I believe I'm out of time. And uh, am I allowed to do this? Uh, talk about other things coming up? Um, uh, sure. Why you okay, good. A couple of big data things, all nonprofit, by the way, coming up. <laughs> and um, I think you're posting these slides if you care to go to these, uh, to this as well. Okay, very good. I will now uh, defer to the, the gentleman from Cisco. Yeah. Well, it's very refreshing to hear Vijay talk about the network. Um, really, five years ago, I did, uh, at that point, cloud computing was coming on board, and it was kind of funny. I mean, m in many events, I mean, the network was totally absent in the discussions. And if you brought them up, people look at you and say, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, and thank you, Tom. I mean, you are, you are bringing something that resonates very much with things I'm going to say. Uh, this event is, let me make sure that I start this so I don't go overboard. Uh, this event, I mean, is fantastic. I mean, I have enjoyed so far uh, all the presentations and all the discussions. So l let me give an angle that is complementary, not opposed, but complementary to many of the things that have been said. The first question I have is this. I want to talk about IoT, Internet of Things. And you will see why. Internet of Things really comes from the convergence of two phenomena. On the left, we have IP networks really expanding beyond the original Internet. I mean, there have been islands so far of using IP because of the productivity in, uh, increase and all that. And on the right, we have the phenomenal advances in wireless. I mean, and we have had a lot of conversations already on that. Now, as a result of that, we converge into a world of trillions of endpoints. And this is the interesting piece there, and I will remark on that later, is that the internet meets the physical world. I mean, DARPA started the term cyber physical systems years back. Uh, this is my favorite thing. Really, is the internet just not communicating messages, but really interacting physically with the physicality of the world. Now, uh, I claim that we go through, we are going through a momentous transition. Today, we have two to three billion endpoints. I don't know how many. Uh, in 2025 or so, we will have one trillion. So the first point is, we have a scalability problem, don't we? And we have a connectivity problem. And the obvious answer is yes, we do have that. But there is more than that. And the point I want to remark, because to me this is a fundamental piece, is today what we have is, on the left, we have almost in every case, almost behind every endpoint, like a smartphone or a tablet, we have a person. As we move to IoT, those sensors will not be, are not being individually connected to the cloud. What we are going to see, and we are already seeing, are systems integrated, I mean, in which we have sensors and actuators. If you want to call them a, a mega or a, a, a macro endpoint, be it. But a connected car has many sensors and actuators within itself. And we cannot just throw the numbers by a trillion or one trillion, two trillion, and claim that that's the problem. Oh, is it better? Probably. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the, the issue is, in this new world, we need to think about, not in individual terms, but we need to think in, as a system, 
what we are doing. What we are doing or want to do in oil and gas, in a smart city, smart grid, etc., etc. And so that requires a system view. And that brings a number of new challenges, opportunities, and there are very important implications for big data and analytics that I will go briefly uh, on. In the first place, we have a very large number of geo-distributed sources. I will elaborate a little more on that. In many cases, we need actionable analytics in real time. We need to make decisions and act and close valves when there is a leak, right there. And uh, then there is a lot that puts a lot of um, load on data management at the edge. And for this, there is some, a concept I want to introduce you to, which we call fog computing. Fog, well, of course, I live right now in Northern California, so I'm very familiar with fog. That's the Golden Gate. You barely see it. It's submerged in the fog. And fog is not, nothing, it's, it's not something negative. Redwoods live because of the fog. In an almost desertic climate, you need that humidity. Anyway, that's a side comment. But what is fog? Fog is a non-trivial extension of cloud computing. Cloud is immensely successful and is here to stay, no doubt. The idea is that some of the cloud computing capabilities have to be extended to the edge for, to support applications that require fast mobility, fast as in a train or a car, that support distributed, geographically distributed applications and large scale control distributed systems. So, just, I am, must be very close. Uh, so, this is complementary. It's not intended to <laughs> substitute what has been said before, but people characterize and I agree with Alex, I mean, I don't necessarily like that classification, but uh, big data's volume, velocity, variety, and veracity, I, had for, I forgot the 4V. Well, I want to add another concept, another dimension, which is the geo-distribution. To me, that is something emerging that we need to pay attention to. And it has a different character. I mean, uh, today, I mean, we have mentioned Hadoop a number of times in a very good way, because I agree with the statements that have been made about Hadoop. I mean, the value and the, the con they have been put in context. Analysts went overboard with Hadoop, in my opinion, in the past, and associated everything that is big data, oh, is Hadoop. I mean, those are two different concepts, right? And the, the point is that if we have a multiple sources of data distributed geographically, the problem is not the Hadoop problem. It's, it's a different thing that we need to handle. And for that, we, what I claim we need is a platform that is hierarchic, first distributed, of course, has compute networking and storage capabilities at the edge, but also is organized hierarchically and also interacts with the cloud. Because big data, and yesterday we had a wonderful conversation with Joy Deep on that, data has different time scales. There are time scales, uh, there is, I don't have time for that, but essentially in, in grid, in the smart grid, for instance, you see things that are actionable in milliseconds at the level of machine-to-machine -machine interactions that need to take place, particularly now with alternative sources of energy and all that, all the way up to the cloud in which you store data that comes from years and you have to be, make predictions about the economy, about where to get um, sources of energy and all so on. So I, I hope I conveyed some of these disruptions that I see coming and that we need to pay attention to.
Um, all right, uh, I'm, I'm going to be giving uh, some perspective on uh, security and big data, or as earlier, Tassos called it as the, the elephant in the room. Uh, but I'd like to share some thoughts on uh, security and privacy aspects related to big data. Uh, scrolling back a little bit in time, uh, I will start off with this report called the JSON report, which appeared, uh, which was published by MITRE, uh, MITRE. Uh, they looked at uh, intelligence analysts uh, who were analyzing data from uh, various data sources. Uh, the classical access control model that's used there is uh, what is known as a multi-level security access control model. Let me oversimplify it by saying that there are four different labels called unclassified, classified, secret, and top secret. A document or a piece of information is annotated with one of these four labels. When an analyst derives an information from document one and document two, he has to associate the derived document with a label which is the max of the input documents. For example, if I derive some information out of a secret document and a classified document, the derived information becomes secret, for example. The observation that they pointed out was that starting with a corpus of information, uh, look at these analysts processing this data over a period of time, in just a couple of weeks, over 90% of the data becomes marked as at least secret or top secret. Essentially, what happens is that very soon nobody can access any of this result of analytics. I mean, you do all this fascinating analytics at really high speeds, but very soon the classification level goes up that you cannot rely upon your uh, access control models any longer. So what happens is that the access control model defaults from an automated system to a manual system where you know I go up the ladder, request my uh, whatever, whoever I'm reporting to their permission, maybe it escalates one level higher, so it, it results in a several days of latency uh, to get access to a relevant piece of information because of this, uh, the way uh, security is set up. So what they pointed out is the need for security to be more agile. I mean, data analytics is really becoming very, very agile nowadays. There is really uh, talks about things that are happening at several terabytes per second. Uh, you really can't, uh, uh, security is becoming an impediment in the process, so there was a need to essentially make security a lot more agile than what it is today. So since then, uh, several folks have been uh, advocating these uh, risk-based models of security. Essentially, what it means is walking the fine line. So there is this trade-off between utility and security or privacy of data, and you have to walk this fine line one way or the other. So to walk this, pri walk this fine line, essentially what is required is a price tag. You know, we have been very effective in putting a price tag on, say, a shoes, a purse, a shirt. We even put price tags on more esoteric and intangible items like car insurance. We can put a price tag on a human life in the form of life insurance. But it's somehow, uh, while uh, we have mastered the art of putting price tag on so many other things, it has been somewhat challenging to put a price tag on a piece of information. It's at times mind-boggling that we can put a price tag on human life but not on a piece of information just as easily. So there are at least uh, three different reasons that people point out as to why this could be the case. Uh, the first is uh, what is known as the join problem or the fear of the unknown. Um, to explain that problem, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's suppose you have one database which has, uh, uh, say, it's, it's on the, it's a census data, population of the U.S. One database has, say, age, sex, and some identifier, and another database has, um, say, zip code and identifier. Now, individually, these databases are known to not have any unique identifying capability, meaning there will be several people who have uh, very similar characteristics in terms of, say, just uh, the name, the, the age, and the sex, or in terms of the zip code. But if you can join this data together, the triplet, meaning the age, the sex, and the zip code, can uniquely identify about 60% of the U.S. population. So this is, the, this is the join, or the fear of the unknown problem, because I might think that the zip code data is not very sensitive, but how do you know that I already have the other piece of data or not? Or I might have the, the age and the sex data already, then you sharing me the zip code information, which is joinable with the old table, can result in a significant security breach, and this is the fear of the unknown. The second important problem is, uh, comes from statistical multiplexing. Now, what it means is that uh, traditionally, when you look at, say, building risk models for insurance purposes or, say, car insurance, I don't have to build a very precise model for Vijay, for example. I need to be uh, precise enough for a population of users because I'm insuring, say, a million people or tens of millions of people. So even if I make some mistakes with respect to Vijay's model, as long as the aggregate adds up, the law of large numbers works in our favor, and everything is jolly good. 
Now, this is almost counterintuitive. With big data, the law of large numbers should be in our favor because we are not talking about millions. We are always talking about billions or uh, uh, even, larger, even larger numbers, which uh, as per Alex doesn't mean anything but for being a very large number. So it should work in our favor, but unfortunately it doesn't. Because uh, unlike uh, uh, the sort of other insurance models, there's sort of level of statistical independence between me running into an accident versus which I running into an accident, for example. But big data platform, any, as much as it can enable you to process on large data in one go, it can also help you steal large data in one go. So the, the sort of the independence assumption sort of starts to break down when things can be stolen in, 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 in group or in, in bulk quantities. The third problem is the undetectability problem. If, 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 if I am engaged, if I, if, I, uh, uh, if I encounter an accident, I know that I have been in an accident. Uh, if I get hurt, I know that I have I've been hurt. But if I lose a piece of information, I may or may not know that I have lost a piece of information. So undetectability is another serious problem that uh, arises when it comes to sort of uh, protecting big data. So with, with these three challenges in mind, uh, I'm not going to prescribe any particular solution here. Uh, but the outlook has been in terms, of, uh, in terms of enriching your risk models. Enriching your risk models to make them more agile, make them more flexible, so that when the operation demands, you can sort of, uh, you can sort of telescopically zoom in and zoom out as to how rich of a risk model you want to use versus how much more abstracted model you want to use depending upon time and resource availability constraints. Uh, so with that, I'll... Uh, for our distinguished panels. So I'll, uh, I had a bunch of canned questions, but I think it's better to be agile and spontaneous to the audience here. So Sanjay? One of the reasons why we cannot uh, price uh, uh, information, whereas we could, uh, was that uh, the join problem, right? right? But isn't that the same thing true with humans? I mean, I sit next to, uh, uh, Todd here, and then we collaborate and something remarkable comes out. But right. still, you have a life insurance for me right. as opposed to me and Todd. So it's exactly the same right. thing. No, I, I've heard this example. The classical example I've heard is me being a physicist and you being a computer scientist, and we invent the first working uh, quantum computer, for example. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, that is indeed the case. So that might just mean that we have to sort of better understand those risk models, convert, identify what is the problem in mapping those risk models that come from, say, the insurance or uh, other domains and borrow them into the information world. So this has been easier said than done. So there have been several efforts to get this rolling. Uh, in fact, it's not very clear, in fact, how much the life insurance takes into account that you may be able to collaborate with somebody else and produce enormous amount of information that otherwise would not have been accessible by the two individuals, for example. So this is something that may be a common problem to both information and, uh, and people. But what is different with information is that the cost of joining is very low. Uh, oh, you had a follow-up question. Yes. So follow up was, oh, sorry. Um, in the human context, the price of anybody's life, my insurance, depends only on my health state, not what I can do or what I can't do. Yeah, so it's a socialist yeah. assumption. Sorry. You. Exactly. So that fundamentally points to the need for understanding value of information more than just the probability of death and what my earning potential is today. So you need these new models, you need these newer risk models for information that can capture all this information uh, so that we can handle uh, you know, the sort of security and privacy issues in big data. Well, uh, I'll comment if there's not a question right away. Uh, I, and maybe you could, maybe this is a question for you. Don't we have a precedence when it comes to somebody stealing information? and the lawsuit ensues, and there's an award, that's the price, right, of right. that information. Could that affect, do you think, the, uh, the future of uh, putting price on data and information? Well, yes, so there is this sort of a feedback loop that you can build in. So, so there are some incidences that happen, some that get reported. 
In fact, a uh, widely accepted percentage of data losses that are reported is way under 20% because it's a matter of reputation. Some people don't report it. Some people are, are forced to report due to regulatory reasons. Like, for example, if a hospital loses information, it's forced to report due to regulatory HIPAA. HIPAA uh, forces the hospital to report information. So there are, uh, there are some instances Trademark of... Trademark copyright infringement. Yes. All put value on information. Yes. So there are all these pieces of, uh, of, uh, of the puzzle that really need to come together. And we cannot, and we have to reason on this, you know, again in real time, because just unlike the past when I could, uh, you know, you could request a file and I could take all my sweet time to determine whether I should share it with you or not, in things like in, uh, Internet of Things or in terms of analog data that you are processing, I need to make split-second decisions on what I want to share and what I don't want to share. So I need to be able to build these very flexible risk models, evaluate them on the fly with all the updated context information and make a yes or no decision. Good point. Okay. So more questions? Okay. So uh, could this is for each of you at least the first three, uh, if there are no other questions. So. Could you, pay? oh, there is, right behind you, okay. So, you know, so I'm, I'm a wireless guy, not a big data guy. And, you know, I understand the wireless industry and, you know, we've enabled things like iPhones and everything. You know, I've been listening to all the talks this morning. And I'm still not I still don't understand fundamentally the business case for big data. I understand how each company can save a lot of money from mining this data. They can keep their customers from churning. I understand how, you know, uh, these uh, companies that insist on storing all this data can save money by storing it with uh, smart codes like Alex is advocating. But I understand how, like, as a consumer, you know, maybe it makes better recommendations for me uh, for movies or restaurants or anything. But, like, what's the real, like, economic impact of this? Has anyone quantified it? What's the value of this industry? And uh, you know, so it's just a very open-ended, curious question. So we have at least two responses here. You go first. I'll go after you. Yeah, I mean, you know, since Brian and I are in the investment profession, I'd like to share kind of our view. Uh, I think, you know, my, it's a fascinating question. The, the, the business case is the opportunity cost. I think every business case starts with the definition of an opportunity cost. So if you look at building cloud scale networks, in my view, it's close to impossible to build a cloud scale network without some degree of automation. And to have some degree of automation, you need big data analytics. So hopefully that conceptually answers your question. And then if you look at you know, some of these service chaining models, creating services on the fly, if you told a Verizon or an AT&T, you know, have a bulletproof plan for uh, the teenage demographic or for the business demographic, and this actually works, there's a willingness to pay for it. So my view is, uh, it's, it's less about the, the value of big data per se, but it's about how big data can be used to solve technically unsolvable problems. I mean, it's very difficult to create the perfect plan for the teen demographic. It's very difficult to build cloud scale networks. It's very difficult to optimize cloud applications on the fly, the Gmail example. And the cost of outage of Gmail or Walmart's big data application is a finite number. So hopefully those answer your questions. Uh, it's also, it, there's also a, a, a monetization value to this uh, as well. So li like if Starbucks figures out that at 9 a.m. a uh, ton of people drink their expensive beverages, I mean, I'm not one of those, but uh, then they, they, they could actually give a promotion to leverage price elasticity and get more people to drink that expensive beverage. So that's big data at work at a very short time scale. So. That's the, uh, related to the urban legend of the diapers and the beer. I don't know <laughs> if you've heard that one. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, quantifying, I have a, a real-world example happening now. You may have heard of Duke Energy, one of our customers. They're the largest provider of um, power in the United States. And the business value lies in the fact that they can take an analog phenomenon called a vibration, process that, and with a special type of analytics called prognostics, if there's enough of the data, meaning bigness of it, right, you will get statistical significance. And from that can determine when the asset will fail. And if you can plan an outage, there's tremendous economic benefit than being surprised by it, right? That data is very intriguing. It goes from my world of engineering and analog data into the world of digital business intelligence and budgeting data. It connects two worlds and goes into a report 
for the next year's budget. And an executive will look at the report and said, ah, I see you have allocated uh, $9 million for a new turbine. Why did you do that? And hopefully they say it's because of us, right? We were able to help them achieve that, you know, as well. But then one more general point. And you, I think if you're in this business, you have an engineering degree, I'm assuming, because those that have them understand what I'm about to say. It's all about statistical significance. And therefore, small data sets limit your conclusiveness. Life is much, much based on probabilities and predictions, right? And therefore, the more data you can have to predict something, the better. And when you sell to a non-engineer, it's hard to consider that intuitively. It's very subtle what I'm saying in the sales cycle of a, of a solution. But in the world where your customers are engineers, they don't want to, add, they don't ask, why should I create more data? They're asking, how can I get the insight out of it? You know, because I know it's there. So I'll, I'll let you ask, ask a question. Here. of elections, sometimes we can predict what the election results are going to be very, very accurately, even though our sample size is pretty small. So, you know, I, I think it depends on the context. If, if you do it right, uh, you can get very precise answers with not much data, if you know how to sample your data and, and how to, you know, get, get uh, the... Oh, there's the always that case. I, I would agree with you, yeah. So it seems to me you imply with your question that cutting costs is not business benefit. I'm not sure if I understand. But you know, if you think about it, you know, humanity uh, progresses by improving productivity. And the way you see productivity increase is as lower cost, right? So at some point, lowering cost has as much business benefit as increasing revenue. It's the same thing. You see exactly the same thing, but from two different perspectives. Yeah, I, I agree. I was I was trying to be a bit uh, inflammatory. I was just uh, you know uh, good, good job, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know it's obviously Can huge economic value to yeah. doing these things more efficiently, knowing what you're doing. Um, but I guess you, you know like when I explain what I do to somebody, I can explain. I do wireless communications. Like you know they they, they intuitively there, there's new things, new products that have been enabled that you could not have done without like smarter ways of doing communication. You know smartphones. You know all of us using wireless laptops. I mean what what is we, like new th world changing products that we're going to see from big data in 10 years? Yeah. Well, the, I mean, that's a, that's a really hard question. Like that? I'll just turn it over here. No, 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 go ahead, but I mean, I went to make a comment. Yes. But the, the um, uh, I don't know if you were really just trying to generate the conversation, but there's case after case after case of value from the big data and, and, and also small data. I mean, Ahmed mentioned a binary case, right? So therefore, the smallness and the probability of getting it right is 50-50 without data, right? So the smallness of it is, um, is, is contingent there. But uh, I just want to say, after, if you'd like to talk more about it, I can give you real hard information on this. Go ahead. No, a brief comment about IoT, because I mentioned IoT. I brought it to the picture. And the reality is that IoT is bringing new actors to the scene, I mean, new situations, and I don't think there are many that will generate, that needs to generate new business models. I don't think that there are many new ones yet there. I mean, that, that's a reality. I mean, and that, of course, has to do with the sensors and actuators and the collection. I mean, who many of the things I was mentioning are in the context, one example. I mean, smart traffic light system is a canonical example I put. It's a smart light that detects when cars are approaching at the speed, the velocity, and see a, a, a child crossing the street and sends alarms and things like that. Uh, but that traffic light, of course, is coordinated with the other traffic lights at the other intersections. What is the value that you put to that? Who runs that and who pays for that? Uh, um, those are things to address. To answer your question about the new technologies, I think that's what you asked. Well, one that is coming is what, what I would call inferential data. Some people call it fuzzy. Some people call it, um, you know, different types of, of, of inf information. But we live in a world of inferences, right? You're making them now about me. It's not explicit who I am, where I come from, but by looking at inferences. And if you have a spouse, you can determine uh, many times the mood espousing because you're inferring the posture, the words, etc. This notion of analytics getting more intelligent and being able to infer requires lots and lots of input to be able to do that when the explicit data is, is not there. So uh, there are startups around the world, I assume, I know of a couple that are working on this notion of uh, fuzzy data or inferential data.
Yeah, and you know, I'd just like to add one quick point to your point about you know looking at five, ten years from now. This is you know my view. Uh, five years from now, we'll see uh, e-health, mobile health as one of the primary use cases of big data. So in my view, you'll have an opt-in situation where uh, there are people who would not mind their you know vitals to be monitored and then send wirelessly to uh, their insurance companies or their primary care physicians. And this is my, my view, uh, that if you continuously monitor uh, you know, human vitals every second of the day, every day, uh, a lot of interesting insight and predictive insight you know, can be gained that helps the, the person and also helps the supply chain, the hospital. And the, so I think e-health, m-health would be a practical use case. Yeah. Can, can oh. Thank you. It's just a more of uh, what we were just uh, brainstorming here, the, Jeff's question. Uh, so what are you know, new products that come out of big data uh, that are concrete? And uh, you know, I was, we were just thinking about it, and I, I want to say search, right? Search, it's like a little text box. You just type a bunch of stuff. You don't see 50,000 servers <laughs> running in the background. So it's easy to, to, to not think that's a big deal, right? And you wouldn't have that. Or another thing is maps, right? Google Maps. So you just type, OK, show me traffic. Show me how to go there. You just think, oh, come on. It's a little thing. It's running on the phone. <laughs> you see the phone, you know? <laughs> right? But you, you don't think there's like 40,000 servers running in the back that allow you to do that. So I think these are very concrete. Well, I'm sure Jeff appreciates that, but he's a <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's easy. Well, I'm going to drive home. I can only drive, for example, home uh, because I can use Google Maps, <laughs> right? <laughs> Otherwise, I get lost. <laughs> so I think, I think that that is, for example, has already disrupted. I mean, of course, there will be more. But I'm, all I'm saying is it's very easy to forget how big a deal and how non-trivial it is to have search and maps and how much that relies on highly non-trivial infrastructure. Yeah, fair point. I would say Siri is of debatable value. Siri is of debatable value. We stand between you and lunch. The rain will be held back, and we'll be reconvening here at 1.15 for the afternoon session, which will focus more on location and big data. Okay, great. And I'd also like to thank our panelists once again for the insights. Thank you. Dr. Alex. Okay. Very good. This, I